Hi, I'm Spencer Christian. On this episode of Tracks Ahead, we'll visit with a man who has combined his love of computers with his model railroad, visit an artist whose passion for railroading has led to his design of collector plates, and go to Michigan, where we can visit the theater and have dinner all while riding the rails. The Milwaukee Road was broken up in the last half of the 20th century. Some of the line was abandoned, but much was picked up by other railroads. In some cases, whole new companies were formed. Let's take a look at a new railroad that has combined public and private sector operations to continue a long tradition of service to southern Wisconsin. A rambling freight train pushes its way through the Midwestern countryside, a common sight to be sure. But what you may not realize is in recent decades, there's been a resurgence in demand for this age-old technology, due largely to the marvelous efficiency of rail transportation. The Wisconsin and Southern Railroad is an inspiring chapter in this tale of rebirth. Well, we currently operate around uh, 650 miles of railroad. Uh, most of it is former Milwaukee road track. And how we really got involved with the railroading is that 1980, when the Milwaukee Road decided to abandon thousands of miles of railroads in the Midwest, the state of Wisconsin realized that if they lost rail uh, to the state of Wisconsin that it would actually stymie the economic growth of the state of Wisconsin. So the state of Wisconsin actually stepped in to buy many of the abandoned uh, lines that the Milwaukee Road were going to put up for abandonment and hopefully find an operator that would operate the rail lines to uh, continue the economic growth for the state of Wisconsin. In the 1980s, Bill Gardner was the owner of Gardner Bender, a successful manufacturing company. So what was it that brought Bill into the world of commercial railroading? I've always had an interest in railroads, uh, just never thought I would be an owner of one. Uh, and 1987, uh, when I had a, a, privately, a publicly held company come and purchase Gardner Bender, I had this uh, check that was pretty sizable and I was 42 years old and I didn't know what to do and I needed a place to go to work uh, compared to just sitting home and counting your money. So I was, had the opportunity to uh, buy the uh, Wisconsin Southern Railroad in 1988, which was at that time a 150-mile railroad. Entering into a unique and mutually beneficial partnership with the state of Wisconsin enabled Bill Gardner to expand his initial purchase into the larger operation he oversees today. There was another rail operator down on the south side of Wisconsin, uh, which was called Wisconsin and Calumet Railroad. Uh, which r roughly was 350 miles of railroad. Uh, they were really uh, stumbling a lot. The state of Wisconsin saw the success of the Wisconsin Southern Railroad and actually asked me if I had an interest in buying the Wisconsin Calumet Railroad. And uh, after negotiating with uh, uh, that organization, I was able to acquire that railroad, which then you know, boosted our railroad you know, up a little bit. Then from there, more opportunities opened up to where I was able to uh, lease the uh, former uh, Chicago Northwestern, which was then the Union Pacific Railroad, Reedsburg line from Madison to Reedsburg. Uh, I was able to uh, cut a couple deals with Canadian Pacific Railroad, which allowed me to acquire more mileage. Uh, so now we're out actually operating a 650 mile railroad in the state of Wisconsin and Northern Illinois. The Wisconsin and Southern Railroad appears very differently today than it did when Bill took over in 1988. Wisconsin Southern was formed actually in 1980 uh, and it was actually operated uh, by a private operator who basically used it as a parking lot for parking rail cars because they were basically a large leasing firm. And when a lot of the cars would come off a lease, they needed to park the car someplace. So really they, they got the operating rights from the state of Wisconsin and basically used it as a parking lot. It's impossible for any railroad to be successful without the dedication of its people. And the Wisconsin and Southern is no exception. Well, the employees really are the success of the railroad. Without the employees, the railroad would not be what it is today. Uh, I take my hat off to them. They work hard, they're dedicated people. Uh, you know, we're just one big family. Uh, everybody gets along mostly with everybody and it's just, you know, a good working relationship and a good partnership with them. And lest you think Bill is merely blowing smoke, consider for a minute just what it takes to keep even a small railroad like the Wisconsin and Southern operating efficiently.
And what does the future look like for the little railroad that could? Expansion, expansion and growth. We're working you know, more and more with more industries that want to come into the state of Wisconsin and Northern Illinois that want to build here. They want a quality service at a reasonable price. Uh, they want somebody that when they actually call somebody on the phone, they're actually getting somebody on the phone versus a, an answering machine. And we provide a lot of services that, you know, class one railroads just are getting away from these days. I think one thing is about the Wisconsin Southern Railroad, you know, we are very unique. You know, it's our employees, you know, they're dedicated. Uh, it's, we have a good management team that works well uh, with each other. Uh, and I think when you have that along with uh, the state of Wisconsin, uh, the five commissions that I work with, uh, we just have one you know, good partnership with everybody working together to expand industrial growth, economic growth in the state of Wisconsin with the assistance of the Wisconsin Southern Railroad being the rail operator. Our hats are off to the Wisconsin and Southern Railroad and the inspiring story of this successful partnership between the public and private sectors pulling together for the common good. The Wisconsin and Southern celebrated its 25th year in 2005 and continues to expand its operations. Moving your entire model train layout 500 miles to a new home can present some challenges. Here's how Darrell Cruz made the transition when he was uprooted from Missouri to Illinois, but the transition allowed him to integrate his love of computers into his railroad. Moving your entire model train layout 500 miles to a new home can present some challenges. Here's how Darrell Cruz made the transition when he was uprooted from Missouri to Illinois. When I built the layout in Missouri, I built it uh, with the idea that at some point in time I would probably have to move it. Uh, it wasn't a module type of thing because I had plaster over the whole thing and the tracks ran from one section to the next, but I was able to unbolt the sections um, and then with all the cars and structures off, of course, I then took my uh, Dremel tool and just cut through the plaster and was able to get the, the layout into four somewhat manageable pieces. Darrell had much more space in the new house for his train room, but first he had to finish the basement. Luckily, his new town became a major source of inspiration. Rochelle, Illinois has an active Union Pacific main line that crosses the Burlington Northern Santa Fe line. It's one of the best train watching spots in the Midwest. Rail fans from all over the country come to Railroad Park to sight trains under a covered pavilion. Darrell's original Union Pacific layout depicted the line from Pleasant Hill, Missouri to Bonner Springs, Kansas, a line that ran just a few miles from his former home. He decided to model a new portion of his layout on his new hometown, but the new basement presented a few difficulties. There was a bay window here, which of course uh, was a little bit uh, tough to decide what to do with it. I also had this 12 foot piece that I moved here from Missouri and that was the hardest piece to fit in this room because it was the longest. Uh, but then I, when I figured out that this would kind of nestle nicely with the, uh, the bay window, um, it kind of set where everything else went and it worked out pretty nice. And then uh, I've always wanted a nice long high bridge because uh, I wanted it to, to still look mid Midwestern. I didn't want any you know, steep cliffs and so forth, so I wanted something to be more, more gentle uh, rolling, and, and the bay window kind of, you know, worked out pretty nice, I think. Using micro-engineering kits, Daryl now has a nine-span, four-tower bridge. The old layout is complete, and he still has plenty of room to work on the Rochelle scene. Rochelle is a beautiful place and a beautiful town and lots of trains, but as far as scenery goes, there's not a whole lot uh, around the, the town except for cornfields. And uh, I have nothing against cornfields, but it's not the most exciting thing to model. Uh, I do plan on having some cornfields on the layout, but I didn't want to have, you know, a layout with just cornfield after cornfield. So um, instead of trying to model the entire, you know, northern part of the state here, um, I basically am planning on concentrating on modeling Rochelle as much as possible and as closely as possible. The rest of the part, the rest of the layout, I'm pretty much uh, freelancing and trying to make it just uh, generic mid Midwestern. The staging yard is tucked into the furnace room and is filled with some very sharp turns. Quite an accomplishment when you consider that Daryl wanted to run seven tracks, some with lines of up to 40 cars. The curvature had to go down to 13 inches, which I was a little concerned about, but I was, uh, I think, somewhat uh, made confident by the fact that all my couplers are body mounted. 
which handles uh, curves a lot better than truck mounted. Um, a lot of the end scale cars come with a couplers mounted on the trucks, which is fine, but if you're going around a lot of sharp curves, it can uh, cause some problems. Um, and the body mounted couplers have really helped and um, for the most part, there haven't been uh, too much trouble getting the trains in and out of the staging yards um, as long as they don't try and back it up all the way through the staging yards. One of Daryl's other hobbies is computers, so it's no surprise that he had fun creating the layout wiring and a computer interface for the signaling systems. His new layout features a Digitrax Digital Command Control Center, which was added to his original electrical blocks. You don't have to mess with the, the flipping of the blocks and so forth. You can just concentrate on running the uh, trains. The marriage of Daryl's two passions, engaged train operations and computer programming, helped him create impressive signaling with a centralized traffic control system. Uh, as the trains go throughout the layout, the computer knows where the trains are and it sets the, uh, the signal indications according to where the train is and it just throws the signals as needed. Uh, depending on where the uh, trains are and, and where uh, one train is going from one place to, to the next. Uh, when we have a group uh, come in and operate, I can uh, change the uh, setup to the dispatcher setup. And uh, with this setup, I'm here at the computer while the trains are being operated by the crews. I can again set the route for that train to come out of the staging yards. Then when it stops, the uh, crews have to you know, call me for further clearance. There's a timetable sheet for each train with information about the trains. The computer shows the track layout and small sections of the tracks light up when trains are present, just like in a real operation. The operators watch the signals and there's usually a yard master in the town of Nelson. They can run about 15 trains at once. Darrell hopes to expand his layout into the entire basement someday. In the meantime, he enjoys bringing the sights and sounds of Railroad Park to life in his own home. So the uh, UP 118. UP 118 is in service, uh, switching out uh, car for car on the interval. 10 4. Darrell continues to expand and enhance the controls and operations of the railroad. Soon we'll meet David Tutwiler, an artist who has been called a painter of light and smoke. When you see his portraits of steam locomotives, you'll know why. But before that, let's go to suburban Detroit, where for 20 years, people have been able to combine a ride on the rails with a little dinner theater. Here's a riddle for you. What serves as a stage for some of the most intimate and engaging theater anywhere? Prepares gourmet dinners for its guests and rolls on steel rails. It's the one-of-a-kind Michigan Star Clipper excursion train, located in suburban Detroit. But just what has made this operation a success for over 20 years? I think because it's unique. I mean, we're, there aren't that many dinner trains out there, and they're, they're pretty few and far between. You know, there's a lot of restaurants, and there's a lot of different attractions, but we kind of combine the best of both. You get the entertainment, plus the dinner, plus the train ride. So. It's just a very unique, romantic, unforgettable evening. We've had several marriages on the train. We've had, oh, I couldn't even tell you how many times we've had people propose on the train. Because it is a very romantic, relaxed setting. It's a three-hour excursion on the train. It's a 22-mile trip at a very leisurely 10 miles an hour. We go through Wixom, Wald Lake, West Bloomfield, through the West Bloomfield Bird Sanctuary which is very pretty, a lot of wildlife back there. And we go to Woodpecker Lake, very picturesque, with beautiful homes all around the water. And then we return here to the depot. While you're on board, you get the five-course dinner, and in between each course, um, you'll see a set of entertainment. We do different types of entertainment on the train. We do a murder mystery show every evening, Tuesday through Saturday. On Sunday, we do a wedding comedy show. And Friday and Saturday night, we do musical shows. Friday, we do a 50s and 60s, and Saturday, we do Broadway jazz. But dinner theater on a moving train, doesn't that present some challenges for the actors? Well, how are y'all doing up there? Working on a dinner train certainly has a few challenges. One is the aisle is about that, lo that big, and there's wait staff coming down uh, at all times, and actors, and we make sure that we choreograph each with each other 
we actually do it in sets so it's not you know 1500 wait staff all at the same time but they're constantly either clearing the table or serving some drinks and by sets I mean they'll serve a soup we'll do a set they'll serve a salad we'll do a set they'll serve the dinner we do a set and they serve the dessert and we do a set How are you? stop upbeat it's uh, the, the comedy shows are all tongue-in-cheek uh, all family uh, oriented so that anybody can come and have a good time there's nowhere else you can go and be on a train and have a nice meal have a good show have some uh, fun entertainment and uh, spend two or three hours just uh, kind of getting away from the world for a while it's not like a restaurant at all except that obviously you're getting food it's much more a an entertainment venue uh, you get a you get a ride on a train you get the show and of course you get a, a fine meal well this rolling improvisational theater must make for some memorable interaction with the audience probably the the one that comes to mind anyway is when one of our people fell on a, on purpose of course uh, fell on one of the gentleman's lap and the wife got all upset about it, started beating the, the dead person. And it was like, it's a show, it's a show. And they knew coming in, you know, so it's kind of, and the dead person, you know, got up and said, would you not hit me? I'm just doing a show here. You know? So it's that kind of fun, you know, and then of course everybody laughs. Larry and Judy Coe purchased a freight railroad in Wald Lake, Michigan in 1984, and then set about the task of turning it into fine dining and entertainment on wheels. What prompted such an ambitious project? Larry and Judy started this some 20 years ago. They had been in the restaurant business formally, and they were looking for uh, a site. Uh, at the time, the track and the depot uh, was for sale. They were for, at first interested in the depot as a possible site for a restaurant, and then uh, that idea developed into actually doing dinner on the railroad rather than in the depot. They saw a, a unique opportunity to do something for themselves, the community, and the rail industry, uh, and have built in that 20 years uh, what we feel is a truly, truly unique dining experience, uh, something that uh, certainly we're all thrilled to be involved in. Uh, great customer response. Uh, and certainly a lot of positive response from the industry. For over 20 years, the Michigan Star Clipper has been truly one of the bright stars of the world of railroad entertainment. Many passengers have returned time and time again. And now that we've been along for the ride, why they do is certainly no riddle to us. There are plenty of starving artists who will tell you how difficult it is to make a living as a painter. And plenty of train enthusiasts will tell you just how expensive their hobby can be. David Tutwiler has built his professional life around two of his great passions, painting and trains. His award-winning portraits of steam engines can be seen around the country. The Romance of the Rail Collection, which he was commissioned to paint in the 1990s, were reproduced onto collector plates. They feature famous trains from the 1930s and 40s that are either still in operation or in museums. Anyone who has put a brush to canvas knows how exhilarating it is to create entire worlds from nothing but a little oil paint and a lot of imagination. For David Tutwiler, it's a way of connecting with the past. All of America has a certain basis in it. Every individual has a little bit of train in them because almost anyone we come across, they either have relatives that have, that have worked for the railroads, been part of trains, they have children that just can't get enough of trains, they've, they've, they used to commute on the trains, everybody somehow is touched by trains. They remember the trolleys in their local communities uh, and trains touched every place, so you can't get away from it. David's research for his work amounts to what train enthusiasts would consider a dream vacation. 
he chases trains around the country. He often visits the actual places where the trains originally ran to take photos and do sketches on location. When he's back in the studio, those sketches and photographs are incorporated into the painting's composition. Although mechanical accuracy is certainly important to David, he's more concerned with capturing a mood on canvas. It's not just the locomotive itself, it's a moment in time. Every locomotive has a unique personality, especially the old steam engines. He likes to think of them as pieces of living sculpture. They seem to breathe in and out as they pull into the station. The steam locomotive is probably the closest machine man will ever get to, to a living creature. Because all other things, machines are a different kind of a mechanism that don't take on that, that essence, like the, the iron horse, the gallop of the iron horse, you know, the, the, the living aspects of the, of the steam locomotive are very unique. I really like to enhance the effect of smoke and steam that comes out of the locomotive. That's probably one of the most exciting things about painting a steam locomotive. The smoke is what gives the action and the movement and the drama. You can tell if a locomotive is speeding down the tracks and the smoke is laying across the train, or if it's standing still and the smoke is drifting up. Um, it, it, it enhances the atmosphere around the engine. You take something very mechanical and very hard, like a locomotive, machinery, and you add smoke and steam, and now you soften things around it, creates atmosphere, it creates its own environment, and makes it very poetic, and makes it very artistic. How could you ever enjoy uh, an old-fashioned movie and really get the romance without the platform having steam, right? Softening things, creating the mood, you know? It's not the same if there's no steam. Capturing a, a train in a particular moment in time, a place, is really the essence of suspending time. And, and for people to react to that and get excited about it and to be enthused about it is, is very satisfying to me as an artist because I feel like I've, I've accomplished something. I feel like I've accomplished something that's important and it may be sparking some hope in them, in, in their own hearts about, about a good time that they remember, a good place or, or something. And that's what art, artwork should be. Artwork should be a reflection of of good things and great hopes and great ideals and, and all that. David has also painted significant pieces depicting traditional American landscapes and sailing vessels, earning him many awards. Well, that's it for this episode. Join us again next time for more Tracks Ahead.